Welcome. Good to see you, Harvest family. Good to see you and be with you again, studying God's Word. Um, welcome. And um, we're going to continue on for our Wednesday night Bible study. We're in the study of, of Joseph's life in Genesis. Uh, we'll be in Genesis 42 and going through those chapters um, of, of God testing, and uh, Joseph testing his brother and God testing them. But by way of introduction, uh, go to, we're going to open with Luke passage in Luke chapter 6, Gospel of Luke chapter 6, and um, we'll read that, get our thoughts vertical, and uh, we'll go from there. Luke 6 verse 37 says, Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the, whip, the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. He also told them a parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye? when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. For no tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person, out of the good, med, good treasure of his heart, produces good. And the evil person, out of the, his evil treasure, produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it, because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that, of that house was great. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I want to say thank you for uh, this time once again and for uh, your church and uh, my church family. I just ask your blessing upon them and on us. Or I ask your blessing, Father, upon your, your word. Uh, may I get out of the way. May your Holy Spirit do the teaching and guide us and direct us. Father, may you be honored in all we do and say. Uh, may your Son, Jesus Christ, be glorified and lifted up and exalted. And may your Spirit have his way. Uh, Father, I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Luke 6, the reason I opened with this um, will probably become more apparent as we go through Genesis, but um, this and then there's a parable, parallel passage in Matthew um, that I like. Same, same thing. He starts out telling them not to judge, um, don't condemn. But then as he goes on and tells the parable, he tells the parable and he goes on and he says, For, verse 43, For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. And so he, he's making a judgment. Don't, we, we can't judge. We're not supposed to judge. We're supposed to watch uh, being a condemning attitude or um, pointing out other people's specs to sin. But yet, it, he goes right on in the next passage and says, we, we are to make, we're supposed to make judgments. Um, how do we judge what's good or bad? And it's just, a, it's a check of our heart. Um, I can't judge people's motives. I can't judge people's hearts, but I can judge people's fruit. And as we get to looking at Joseph and his interaction with his brothers, I think that's what he's trying to do, is he's trying to help them see, um, see their hearts. Out of the heart produces good. Um, out, of the, out of good treasure. If I have a good heart, I have good, I'll have good fruit. And then um, 
he goes on and tells them about, because what comes out of my mouth is directly related to my heart. He says, for out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks, in verse 46. And what comes out of our mouths, especially we as believers, uh, we as Christians, the church, verse 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord? That's very telling, um, what we say. We can sound really good. Uh, but why do you call me Lord, Lord, he says, and not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me, comes to me and hears and does them. Um, that's good fruit. Bad fruit, uh, this man, he, he hears, verse 49, the bad, bad, or the bad fruit or bad um, treasure, a heart that is not good. Verse 49, the one who hears, he hears, but he does not do. Um, and that will come into play, or I'll, we'll probably try to come back to this if I remember about the end of our lesson. Our lesson tonight is uh, when we get you can turn to Genesis 42. And Genesis 42, 43, 44, uh, Joseph tests his brothers. And like I said, uh, if, um, I don't know the heading on our title or on our, on the video tonight it should be, or what, what I told is, is the God who tests. And that's what we're going to look at. Um, just for context, as you go to turn to Genesis, um, to remember where we've been, looking at Joseph's life. Um, he, uh, if you remember, he was in the prison, chapter 41, and then he was lifted out to interpret Pharaoh's dreams. So he gives the interpretation, and then at the end of chapter 41, verse 53, what he has predicted or what he said the dreams um, meant, his interpretation comes true. Verse 53, the seven years of plenty that occurred in the land of Egypt came to an end, and the seven years of famine began, began to come, as Joseph had said. God's confirming um, his prophet, his man. <clears throat> there was famine in all the lands, but in the land of Egypt there was bread. When all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, go to Joseph. Go, what he says, hear, and do. Go to Joseph, what he says, do. So when the wise advice, that's that's, like I said, that's Pharaoh's testimony last time. That's what he heard. He heard what Joseph said. He recognized it as truth, and he did it. And he humbled himself. He gave all his power, his kingdom, and turned the keys over the kingdom over to Joseph. Um, so when the famine, verse 56, had spread over all the land, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians. For the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Moreover, all the earth came to Egypt to Joseph, came to Egypt, to Joseph to buy grain, because the famine was severe over all the earth. That brings us to 42, chapter 42. Seeing the, our view goes back to um, Joseph's home, the home of Jacob and his uh, family. Verse 40, chapter 42, verse 1. When Jacob learned that there was grain for sale in Egypt, he said to his sons, Why do you look at one another? And I, that's interesting. I love that that thought. Um, in end of chapter forty one, the people are are the famines beginning to take effect. The people are starting to hunger, and are starting to have want. And they go to Pharaoh. And what does he say? Go to Joseph. What he says, do. And here the brothers are back. You, get, you just get this little glimpse of the, of the scene in Jacob's home. And all the other brothers, the, the brothers who sinned against Joseph, the famine's hitting, uh, the pressure of building and, uh, on the family, and what, where are they looking at each other? And I just have to ask, uh, where do you look when the pressure comes? Who do you go to? Where, where do you turn? And the look of uh, them looking at each other. And sin does that. Uh, sin is pictured as you know, thorn bushes, You're, it tangles your way, it, it, it hinders your walk, it causes, it, it does, it causes the inaction in us. Um, why do you look at one another? 
Pharaoh wisely pointed the people to look to Joseph because he realized he was God's man. And here Jacob says, why do you look at one another? And I just see these guys um, as the pressure, the temptation, the struggle comes. They're looking at each other. They don't know what to do. They don't know God's ways. They don't understand God's wisdom. Where do I look? And the pressure comes. This is the application for me. Why, where do you, why do you look at one another? And he said, behold, verse 2, I have heard that there is grain for sale in Egypt. Go down and buy grain for us there that we may live and not die. So ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt, but Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with his brothers, for he feared that harm might happen to him. Thus the, thus the sons of Israel came to buy among the others who came, for the famine was in the land, great in the land of Canaan. That's significant. We'll talk about that. Why he holds Benjamin. If you remember... If you're tuning in and you haven't, don't remember the whole story, uh, Jacob had two wives, long story, soap opera story, you can go back and read it. He ended up with two wives. He favored the one and uh, more than the other. The, the one, Leah, who was not favored, that he um, got by trickery, by deceit, um, he had four children, for, four sons from her right away, and a daughter, Dinah, that we know of. And I think Rachel, I believe it was Rachel, not Rebecca. Rachel had, she was barren. Um, and eventually did have Joseph. And then died later in childbirth with Benjamin. And then the whole family dynamic things comes into play. There's also the two, what do you want to call them, concubines. Um, four women in this guy's life. Jacob's got his own problems. We talked about that weeks ago when we were in, in that, those, those chapters. But he will not release Benjamin. He said he holds Benjamin back um, because I think of, of, of Jacob's problem with favoritism. So brother, the other brothers go to, to Egypt to find bread. Now Joseph was governor of the land. He was the one who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed themselves before him with their faces to the ground. Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them, but he treated them like strangers and spoke roughly to them. Where do you come from, he said. They said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. And we'll find out later in the chapter that he's speaking through an interpreter. And so he's speaking Egyptian, the Egyptian language, and um, so he's, he's, he's dressing and looking like an Egyptian, and he's putting on, um, he's... He's putting up the front that he's a, he, he doesn't know them, and they, they're unaware. And he said to them, you are spies. You have come to see the nakedness of the land. They said to him, no, my Lord, your servants have come to buy food. That's true. We are all sons of one man. It's also true. Then he gets fishy. We are honest men. <clears throat> your servants have never been spies. And you recognize, realize, remember that Joseph knows them. They don't know who, who they're talking to. We are honest men. That statement, we'll talk about that. Your servants have never been spies. Really, we're going to talk about that. And he said to them, No, it is the nakedness of the land that you have come to see. And they said, We, your servants, are twelve brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, the youngest is this day with our father, and one is no more. But Joseph said to them, It is as I said to you, you are spies, by this you shall be tested. By the life of Pharaoh, you shall not go from this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of you and let him bring your brother, while you remain confined, that your words may be tested, whether there is truth in you. Or else, by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. And he put them all in, all together in custody for three days. And that's why we landed on this of, of God testing, the God who tests. Um, Joseph is testing his brothers. And we're going to spend most of our time talking about that tonight. Um, we'll kind of highlight the next chapter 42, 43. 44 is the testing. We get into a lot of detail here, more detail than we've had about these guys, this, this story. Um, 
they really, it really zooms in and we see a lot of detail. And I'm just going to let you kind of read through it on your own. We'll hit the highlights. Um, but God, through Joseph, is testing their hearts, testing their lives. Just, and they, because when they say, <clears throat> verse 11, and we are sons of one man, we are honest men. And just, you read that, you know, if you didn't know anybody, you, you, they could say, you could say, yeah, they are. Um, we are. Your servants have never been spies. We can gloss over that. Um, but just by way of reminder, remember, uh, remember these guys, who they were. Um, back in chapter 30, 34, uh, we, we were there weeks ago, the defiling of their, of their sister. Uh, Dinah was the sister of uh, four, the oldest Reuben. Judah and Simeon, Levi, those four brothers had a sister named Dinah, and we won't go back, but you can look at it. Um, Dinah was, was raped by a man, and he said he loved her, and he wanted to marry her, and they tricked him. They basically said, yeah, you can have her if, you, if the whole, your whole nation becomes circumcised, your whole tribe. And they, they did. And those guys used that to destroy these people. Um, back in chapter 34, on the third day, verse 25, when they were sore from the surgery that they just underwent, two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, took their swords and came against the city while it felt secure and killed all the males. Everything, they spied out the whole land. They spied out. They, made, they conspired to, to make this plan. They used God's ordinance they use God, their, their religion, their faith, so to speak, against these people. They're honest men, though, in their, in their own eyes. You see how our hearts are so deceitful? They killed. They didn't just kill Hamor and his son Shechem, the, the man and his son who perpetrated this, this crime on their sister. They killed all the males with the sword, and took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went away. And then, verse 27, the sons of Jacob, their bro all their brothers, the sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because they, they had defiled their sister. They took everything, women, children, their, all their wealth, their goods. But they're honest men in their eyes. Um, verse, that's chapter 34. Uh, chapter 37 is when Joseph got um, kidnapped by them. Uh, when he's, he's sent by his father to go check on them, they're shepherding sheep. Uh, chapter 37, verse 15, a man, man found Joseph walking. Joseph's looking for him. He says, I'm seeking my brothers. Tell me where they are. And if you know where they're at, where they're pasturing the flock. And he hit, says, I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. Verse 18, they, his brothers, saw him from afar. And before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. Like spies. Sneaking, watching, making a plan behind his back, and they, they conspired. Oh, but they're honest, they're honest in their mind. By this you shall be tested. You are honest men. We are honest men, they said, and your servants have never been spies. And, and so he... He, Joseph knows this. And Joseph knows what's going on, and he, their hearts, like mine, like ours, are deceitful beyond measure, desperately wicked. Who can know it? Jeremiah 17 says. Um, we are blind, like um, that parent, like when I, the reason I read the Luke, Luke chapter 7, or yeah, Luke chapter 6. Um, we, we magnify other people's sins and we minimize mine. My, the log that's in my eye, I don't notice it. I make it, so, I make it so small, and I notice the speck in other people's eyes. I make that larger than it really is, so I don't have to recognize the log in my own. And I think, and we're blind to it. These guys, they're blind to their sin. But the pressure God has allowed, this famine that's taken over the land, and it's now affecting this family, um, it's drawing, them, it's drawing them back to, to Joseph. It's, God is bringing their sin to the surface. Um, let's, we'll just continue on in the story, and then we'll, I'm going to do some jumping around the scriptures and talk about the God who tests. 
So he puts them all in custody and back in Genesis 42. He put them all together in custody for three days. On the third day, Joseph, verse 18, on the third day, Joseph said to them, do this and you will live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers remain confined where you are in custody and let the rest go and carry grain for, your, for the famine of your households. And bring your youngest brother to me, so your words will be verified and you shall not die. And they did so. And you start to see uh, Joseph, how Joseph's wisely doing things God's way to reveal their hearts. It's starting to work. Verse 20, 21. Then they said to one another, In truth, we are guilty concerning our brother. In that we, we saw the distress of his soul when, we, when he begged us and we did not listen. That is why this distress has come upon us. And Reuben answered, Did I not tell you not to sin against the boy? But you did not listen. So now there comes a reckoning for his blood. And you can see, read that, <clears throat> and you think, well, maybe they're, they're repenting. Not yet, I don't believe. Um, we have to, we, because we're sinful creatures, our hearts are deceitful. They are just now, they're beginning to feel the effects of this sin. And there's a difference between, between genuine conviction and re true repentance. We'll get there. They get there eventually. And just regret over my sin. Um, I, I, I hate how this has caused hurt to my family, this sin. I don't like seeing um, the effects of my sin, but it's not, my heart has not truly been broken yet. And they're starting to feel uh, regret by, just by way of, I thought of this passage as I thought about opening with this. You can write it down or follow along. 2 Corinthians 7 talks about the difference between worldly repentance and, and godly repentance. And these guys, Joseph, like I said, he's, he's a type of Christ. And he is a messenger to bring these guys into recognition of their sin. So that they will can, can truly see their wicked hearts, and their need of a Savior. And 2 Corinthians, Paul, uh, Paul goes through the difference between godly grief, which brings salvation, and, and worldly, worldly grief, worldly, worldly repentance. You can repent in a worldly way. And just uh, for context, in 2 Corinthians 7, he's written a couple letters to the Corinthian church. Uh, one was very severe. We don't we don't have it, um, but it made them grieve. Let's just back up to verse five. For even when we came into Macedonia, Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were afflicted every turn, fighting without. There was the external pressure and fear within. Paul was struggling without within. But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted by you, the church of Corinth, as he told us of your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced still more. Why did they, why were they, were they had this change of heart? You don't know the whole story unless you read it. But for even if I made you grieve with my letter, Paul wrote a harsh letter to cause them to repent and pointed out their sin. If I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, Though I did regret it, for I see that the letter grieved you, though only for a while. As it is, I rejoice. Not because you were grieved. He wasn't trying to hurt, but it had a purpose. He had a purpose. But because you were grieved into repenting. We're not, we don't just want to cause harm and hurt and hurt people's feelings. That's not Joseph's, what Joseph's doing. That wasn't Paul's plan with his letter. He wanted them to come to an awareness of their sin. Because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For, verse 10, godly grief produces. It produces fruit. There's a, there's a genuine spiritual fruit. That means a changed life. That's what we're going to hopefully see in Joseph's brothers. That's what we want to see. Godly grief produces. It does something. It doesn't cause you just... To have regret and not be able to move, stand there looking at each other like the brothers, it, it 
and change, you move. For godly grief produces a repentance to salvation. It brings salvation. It brings salvation from sin, whether initial salvation from your sin or sanctification. It, it, a repentance to salvation without regret. You can move on. You can leave it at the cross. Not that it doesn't come up and you have to do, work through that again, but you, there's no regrets. Whereas worldly grief produces death. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you. It produces an earnestness. What eagerness to clear yourselves. What in, indignation over sin. You, there's a, a righteousness, a godliness that will sin causes the indignation and repulsion in you. What fear. You recognize the, what sin does. The, and there's a fear. Um, what longing. A longing to make things right. What zeal. What punishment. I think that's a punishment of, of willingness to cut off your, your punish yourself. You cut off the pathway of your flesh to return to that sin. If your right eye causes you to offend, it causes an offense, you pluck it out. You take drastic measures in your flesh and in, in yourself. You punish yourself. You bring this body under discipline, Paul describes it. It's a punishment. You're punishing because you hate your sin. It brings its salvation. Um, so at every point you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. I don't spend enough time there. But that's, that's what you're starting to see, this first steps of of repentance in these guys and they haven't gotten there yet but they're starting to have regret over their sin they're starting to see the effects of what sin in their lives they're starting to feel it um, so they see they are starting to have these thoughts about God's doing this they do they did not know here it is verse back in chapter Genesis 42 that, verse 23 they did not know that Joseph understood them, for there was an interpreter between them. Then he turned away from them and wept. That shows you his heart. He wasn't trying to hurt. He wasn't, the, Joseph's heart towards them was one of love. He wasn't trying to get revenge. He, he had the power of Pharaoh. He could, have, he could have lined these guys up against a wall and executed them immediately as soon as he recognized them. The, the deceit or the, the hiding himself was to bring conviction over them. He wept. And he returned to them and spoke to them. And he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes, giving them a taste of the, of the effects of sin. I think Simeon, why he was one of the older ones, Reuben was disqualified um, because of his sinful past with his mother or his yeah, his stepmom. He's, he's one of the honest men also. I forgot about that one. So he binds Simeon. I think because Simeon was one of the, the one that led the um, slaughter of those men. <clears throat> we don't know, but it doesn't say. But verse 25, And Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain and replace every man's money in his sack. They, didn't know he, they did not know he was doing that. And to give them provisions for the journey, this was done for them. And I just see, I see grace, grace there, um, God's grace. He's, he, he didn't need to do that. He, he gave them what they came for, but he gave them their money back. You can't buy God's grace. You can't buy it. Grace is, you, you don't earn it. You don't pay for it. And he, he didn't need to give them provisions. But he does it because they're his brothers and he loves them. This was done for them. And the story goes on. Uh, they load their donkeys as they head out. They get a day's journey out. They stop for the night. And one brother opens his sack and there's his money's there. He recognizes it. At this, their hearts failed them and they turn trembling to one another. In verse 28, what is this that God has done to us? They're starting to realize God is in control. And, and you're starting to see a little more conviction. I, I don't think this is full conviction of repentance. They're starting to feel the condemnation of, of God, of the awareness of their sin, and realizing that God is watching. That's what Joseph's doing. Joseph is demonstrating that he is Pharaoh. He has the power of Pharaoh. He is in control. He's watching. Um, he's bringing bringing their sin to, to light. 
and he's all their money has been recalled. Father says to them, you have bereaved me and my children. Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more, and now you would take Benjamin. All this has come against me. Then Reuben said to his father, kill my two sons. If I do not bring him back to you, put him in my hands, and I will bring him back to you. But Jacob, the father, says, but he said, <clears throat> my son shall not go down with you, for his brother's dead, and he is the only one left. If harm should happen to him on the journey that you are to make, you would bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to Sheol. Um, Jacob doesn't trust Reuben. <laughs> he doesn't trust Reuben with Benjamin for good reason, I believe. Ju Judah later makes the same offer, and he takes he he listens to him. Verse chapter forty-three. So they were, the instruction was that Joseph sends him back and says, "Bring back Benjamin, and Simeon will be released, and you'll prove yourselves as honest men." Now the famine was severe in the land, chapter 43. And when they had eaten the grain that they brought from Egypt, their father said to them, Go again, buy us a little food. I have a feeling that months have gone by, or a year, I don't know how long the provision they bought, or initially how long that lasted. But the instruction was to go home, get Benjamin, and come back. Delayed obedience is still disobedience. Um, the reason they delay is their father. And I just, I just, I was been meditating on this, and I just cautioned me as like, um, how often have I gotten in the way of what God was trying to do in my kids or someone else, trying to protect, trying to protect or shield them from God's discipline or God's working. Um, God is working on Jacob. Why did Joseph ask for Benjamin? I think to help Jacob see his heart, his role of, instead of, of fo fostering the animosity between the brothers because of his favoritism between the wives and his indulging in with the other women and all that that brought into the family. Um, Joseph's test. God's testing Jacob, the father. And they wait. They don't. Um, Simeon is in jail. He's waiting it out. And he doesn't seem too concerned about him. That's, that's sad. Jacob. But when the food runs out, once again, the pressure, the, the famine, pressure, the test is what causes me to finally deal with, deal with my sin. And so there's this whole interaction. Judah makes a pledge. Um, he says, I will go back. Verse, verse 8, And Judah said to Israel, his father, 43 verse 8, Send the boy with me, talk about Benjamin, and we will arise and go that we may live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. I will be a, I will be a pledge for his safety. For my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. He's willing to take this on himself. That You see the earnestness of a true repentance. The zeal. Willing to put yourself on the line. Taking steps. Um, and, and, he, and he acts on it. When he, jumping ahead in chapter 44, at the end of when the confrontation comes out, um, J Judas says at the end of chapter 44, he says, For your servant became, your servant, ta he's talking to Joseph now, for your servant became a pledge of safety for the boy to my father, saying, If I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father all my life. Now, therefore, please, let your servant remain instead of the boy as a servant to my Lord. And let the boy, Benjamin, go back with his brothers. For how can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? I fear to see the evil that would find my father. Um, punishment. What punishment? True godly grief brings. He's willing to punish his own flesh and, and take bear, bear the, the cost of his, of his sin. Um, he's willing to, to step. And so Ju I, Judah, the, you start to see um, God working in their heart and they're starting to see it, the rise to the surface and they're starting to recognize their sin and deal with it. Deal with it God's way. So, um, 
They go back, they go back the second time. Um, Joseph saw Benjamin back in 43, verse 16. Joseph saw Benjamin with them. He said to the steward of his house, Bring the men into the house and slaughter an animal. Make ready for the men are to dine with me at noon. Uh, the man did as Joseph told him and brought the men to Joseph's house. And the men were afraid because they were brought to Joseph's house. And they said, it is because of the money which was replaced in our sacks the first time that we are brought in so that he may assault us and fall upon us to make us servants and seize our donkeys. They're worried about their, they're worried about their donkeys. They're worried about their possessions. They're, they don't recognize, the, you know, like I said earlier, I think the, Joseph gave him back the money. They, what is a few bags of gold or silver worth to, to the man who has everything? We, we've read in, during the times of planting there was so much grain, Joseph could, they stopped counting it. A few bags of grain, what's that to, what's that to Joseph? Who, um, it's interesting what, he, what the servant says. They try to explain to the to the, to the steward, Joseph Stewart, about the, about the money. They said we brought the, they must have got um, replaced by accident. We brought money again with us, end of verse 21, verse 22. And we have brought other money down with us to buy food. We don't, do not know who put our money in our sacks. He, the steward, this is an Egyptian steward. Uh, look at Joseph's influence in this guy's life. If he was not a believer, he was close. He replied, peace to you. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has put treasure in your sacks for you. I received your money. This guy, he understood God better than these, these boys, um, these men. He says he received, he got paid. So who paid for it? They got their money back. Somebody had to pay for it. Joseph did. I, I, I'm, it doesn't say it, but I guarantee you, I, when we get to heaven, Joseph paid for that. that. It, was, it, meant, it was nothing to him. He had an abundance. And it's the kindness of God that brings men to repentance, Romans says. They don't understand grace. We don't, we, you know, religion, it's us trying to earn, earn favor with God. Grace just doesn't make sense to us. Um, and he, Joseph is showing them grace, the grace of God, providing for them that they don't deserve. Paying, paying away, and they, they don't understand it. In, a, in our sinful, self-centered, selfish, self-righteous ways, we want to be. We think we have to earn it. We have to pay for it. No. Then he brought Simeon out to them. So they take care of them. And you, they have this feast. Um, he start, Joseph sits down and starts asking them about their father. They're sitting in order, birth order. He's demonstrating they don't, they don't understand how can this man know all this. He's showing them that he knows everything about them. That's what God reveals to us. He's, he's in control. He knows everything and he still loves. He still wants to work in their lives. The men looked at one another in amazement. And portions were taken to them from Joseph's table. So Joseph, chapter 44, Joseph tests the brothers their guilt is found out. Um, he sends them away from the city with their provision, their food, and he puts everything back in, their money back, and his silver cup that identifies it as Joseph. And he basically traps them, tricks them. And um, you see, you just see, con as the he sends, Joseph sends a steward out to, to confront them, and he does, and you just see them they start to lower their sacks, open their sacks, and, they, and they, he says, um, how can we steal silver or gold from your Lord's house? Verse eight, nine, verse nine, Which, whichever of your servants is found with it, the cup, shall die, and we also will be my Lord's servants. They say, we'll be your slaves, if this is true. They don't know about it. Verse 10, he said, let it be as you say, he who is found with it shall be my servant, and the rest of you shall be innocent. Then each man quickly lowered his sack to the ground, and each man opened his sack. And he searched, beginning with the eldest and ending with the youngest, and a cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Then they tore their clothes, and every man loaded his donkey, and they returned to the city. They don't say a word. They just tear their clothes, and 
they're, they're, they're caught. And um, when Judah, verse 14, when Judah and his brothers came to Joseph house, Joseph's house, he was still there. They fell before him to the ground. Joseph said to them, what deed is this that you have done? Do you not know that a man like me can indeed practice divination? And Judah said, what shall we say to my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how can we clear ourselves? God has found out the guilt of your servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also in whose hand the cup has been found. But he said, Far be it for me that I should do so. Only the man in whose hand the cup was found shall be my servant. But as for you, go up in peace to your father. You see, the conviction start to come upon him. And Judah, um, they, they surrender to what, what's, what's happening. And they offer to all be servants. And Joseph says, No, just the one who's, in whose cup is found, Benjamin, saying the rest are free. And this is when Judah steps in. And says, I'm going to take his place. Uh, chapter 45 then, um, he reveals himself. Uh, so you see conviction, you see surrender and, and punishment at the end of chapter 44. And in chapter 45, you see reconciliation. Um, when, they, when he talks with them, he basically forgives them. And Joseph said to his brothers, come near, please. And so he, he reveals himself to them. And Joseph says, if God has sent, basically tells him, God sent me, God sent me, verse 5, verse 7, God has sent me ahead. It's not you who sent me here, it was God. He testifies. And basically, I guess, um, what I want you to see is, we'll, we're going to wrap, we need to wrap this up. How long, how long have I gone? Do you know how long I've gone? Wow. Um, I haven't even gotten to my point yet. Um, but God is the one who tests. God has been is orchestrating. Joseph has been doing all this, but God is the one who's orchestrating all of this. God is the one who tests men's hearts. Um, I'm just going to bounce through and show you what God is doing and why God does works like this. Um, we're going to hit Psalm four, Psalm eleven. You can write these down. I'm going to be turning pretty quickly. Um, Psalm eleven, verse four. The Lord is in His holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see, his eyelids test the children of man. The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Uh, Proverbs 17, verse 3. Um, I'll just quote that one. Proverbs 17, verse 3. The crucible for silver, the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests men's heart. Um, Job 23, 10 is similar to that. He knows the way that I take. And when he has tried me or tested me, I shall come forth as gold. That's a statement of faith Job is saying that God knows the way that, that I take. And he's going to, he's, when he tests and tries me, it's going to produce something. It's going to purify. Um, part of the purpose of what God is doing in these, in these men's lives and in us, it's to reveal, it's to purify. Um, like heating up metal so that the dross can be taken away, the dross of sin, and then the silversmith has material to make a vessel. I know the proverb says that's what God is doing. He's trying to do something in our lives. So he's, it has a cleansing effect. Oh, what are there? Some of the other verses. Uh, Jeremiah 17, that passage, 17 verse 5, thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a a shrub in the desert, he shall not see any good come. See the lack of fruit? It's dead, it's dry. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes. For its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. You either cursed because you're trusting in your own strength and trusting in men or your, own, your strength as a man, or you're blessed because you're trusting in God's strength, in God's ways. And there's a picture of, of death and deadness or dryness or fruitfulness. Verse, verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? 
What gets in the way of me being fruit, fruitful? My wicked, deceitful heart. I, the Lord, search the heart, verse 10, and test the mind. To give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. Those wicked brothers, they had no clue how wicked and sinful, how far away from God they were. Praise God. They're, they're praising God in glory, I believe, because of the famine. That brought them to Joseph so that they could come and hear what Joseph said and do. That, that's, that's Luke 6. What good is it to say, Lord, Lord? Why do you just call me Lord, Lord and not do what I say? And that's why he goes into the, parable, into the parable about the man who built his house on the rock. The testing, the, the, it, it, it cleanses, it punishes sin, it causes me to turn away from sin. Um, the test, testing of God, it purifies, it produces fruitfulness, it, it prunes, and it, it reveals what my foundation is on, what am I building upon. Um, Luke, Luke 6. Um, probably the most famous in our church anyway, as a disciple, a student and a disciple of Pastor Saucer, uh, Hebrews 12. Um, won't take time to read it. You can. Um, testing, discipline, it proves that you're one of God's children. And you can praise God for that. Um, it's, 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 it's proof of his love. It's him showing you that he loves you too much to let you continue in sin. And he has a better plan for us, better plan for you. So as you go through this week, as you watch for testings, as we go through this period in our culture of the test that we're going through, see what comes up. See what, what it reveals. Um, watch how God is using it to draw you in a certain direction, like the famine, uh, like the test, or like, like the whatever pressure God is bringing in your life the flood, the stream that proves what the house was built upon in, in Luke 6, um, and give, you know, do then, take steps to correct or give praise to God for what he's building and doing in your life. So, God bless, thank you for your attention, and uh, may the Lord bless and keep you. God bless everybody.